from Two Keto LLC. It's Keto Woman Podcast with Daisy Brackenhall. Hello, Keto lovelies. I'm Daisy Brackenhall, and I've spent most of my life struggling with my weight and confidence, and I've always had a difficult relationship with food. Even when I finally got to my target weight, after weight loss surgery and eating low carb, I couldn't maintain it and I was miserable. Keto has given me the freedom to fall in love with food again, without the constant gain, loss, guilt, virtue cycle of before. Health and happiness is where it's at now, running on fat. Welcome to the Keto Woman podcast. Each week, I'll be chatting to inspirational women, maybe even the odd man, to discover the secrets to their success so that I can share them with you. So what is keto? Keto is a way of eating that enables you to switch your body's main fuel source from sugar to fat. Who doesn't want to be a fat burner, right? But how do we achieve this? A great place to start is by keeping carbs to 20 grams or less per day. So things like leafy greens and above ground vegetables, plus some nuts and seeds and the incidental carbs you find in things like dairy. Moderate protein scale to your lean body mass and then fat to satiety. Once you're in the swing of things, you can tweak it to suit you. Make your own personalized keto. I'll be asking my guest each week what their keto looks like to show you just how flexible and fabulous this way of eating can be. I'm not a doctor and most of my guests won't be either, so we can't give you medical advice. It's always best to work with your own doctor because they know you and your medical history and so have access to the bigger picture. This week's extraordinary woman is Mary McKnight. Mary is one of the top medical alert service dog trainers in the US. She has helped to train over 150 medical alert dogs for diabetes, seizures, migraines, POTS and AFib with people from all over the world through online and in-person classes. Mary has won multiple national awards for her training, spoken at dog training conferences on the topic of service dog training, been an expert witness for court cases involving service dogs, been featured on TV, radio and all over the internet. Mary is a teacher, an author and a disability rights advocate has a canine study certificate and has attended over 20 educational conferences on the science of dog training. She started her service dog training program in 2008 because she needed a service dog and could find no one to help her train her own dog. Mary was originally diagnosed with depression and social anxiety, but after learning how to train medical alert dogs for diabetes using her own dog, she found out that her zombie panic anxiety attacks were actually severe hypoglycemia episodes when her dog started spontaneously alerting her 10 minutes before her blood sugar went low. Eventually, like her father and grandparents on both sides of her family, she became a type 2 diabetic. Mary started keto in October 2017 and has lost 40 pounds, reduced her neuropathy, migraines, eczema, high blood pressure and her endometriosis symptoms, stabilised her severe blood sugar swings and her A1C has gone from 6.7 to 5.1. I'm pretty sure you're going to be as taken with Mary and her story as I was. Her passion for her dogs and the work she does is both palpable and infectious. What an extraordinary woman she is indeed. Welcome, Mary, to the Keto Woman podcast. How are you doing today? I am doing fantastic. It's lovely to be speaking to you today. Why don't you tell me a bit about your life before you came across keto? All right. So um, we used to tease my mom that like nothing was homemade in our house unless it came out of a box. So... You know, like my mom made uh, beef stroganoff out of boxes, macaroni and cheese. You know, uh, as a kid, we were we were fed a lot of boxed food and it was a lot of processed and prepared food. My dad was a DEA agent and we got assigned to living in Pakistan. And that's kind of where my uh, kind of sugar addiction started. I I was a little kid. I was probably eight years old at the time. It was the 1980s. And in Pakistan, there was literally no safe water to drink. Like you had to literally process your own water or get water from the embassy. And so there was a lot of soda pop, you know, and uh, Coke that we, we drank and in our household. And I really feel like that's where 
um, you know, I kind of became addicted to sugar. It's because you know, there was, there was yeah. nothing else to drink. Basically, it was either that or get Jardia. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and, and I got Jardia multiple times, and we had to, you know, take a ton of medication that you know killed off the parasites and protozoa in us and stuff like that. And um, it was not a very, you know, pleasant process. But uh, I, I really think that, you know, my my life with, with my parents and they were doing as best as they could, you know, in, in the 1980s, we didn't have the internet or anything to help them along, you know, in, in helping with nutrition information. So I don't fault them at all for, for my sugar addiction that I have. Uh, but, you know, I, I do think it definitely was, you know, ingrained in my brain as a child to uh, enjoy sugar and sugar is safe and sugar is fun and sugar is comforting. So, and and I I feel like I'm really a serious um, sugar addict and I've been overweight literally all of my life. (laughs) So how long were you in Pakistan for? We were in Pakistan for two years and uh, we had to leave because my dad kept getting sick and the the entire family kept getting sick over and over again with Jardia and, you know, all of the parasites and in the food over there and you know like it's it's literally like biblical times over there like they're literally you go to the market and there's food lying on the ground and the food that was fed to us was food that was carried in a cart with donkey poop in inside of it you know and it was it was just not uh the you know standard american diet that you know we had been used to where we had sterilized water and sterilized food and boxes. Yeah, so that really messed with your gut, presumably. Absolutely. And like you're saying, so the rest of your family, do they have ongoing issues like you do from the same thing? Yep, my mom has IBS. My dad, you know, had, uh, you know, a, probably a page worth of diagnosis problems from, you know, being in Pakistan. My sister has uh, endometriosis, just like I do. Um, that drug that they use to kill the parasites is known for causing, um, you know, fertility problems and and gut issues. And so, yeah, I, I definitely feel like my my time in Pakistan uh, negatively affected my gut health and microbiome for sure. Crikey, it sounds like it. So it not only did that, but you know, landed you with this intense sugar addiction as well. It, yes. I, I I am an addict, basically. Yes. Mm. And so you returned to America, did you from from Pakistan? Yeah, yeah. we moved to uh, Detroit. Actually, <laughs> been there since. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And how did things progress from there? You know, what other kind of issues? I mean, we've had a bit of a chat before the show, but you know, you've you've mentioned, uh, you know, perhaps some some mental health issues and things yes. like that. And perhaps you could tell me a bit about the other things that developed along the way. So um, I was initially like when I was in college, my senior year of college, I had some issues with uh, remembering things. I was having problems with remembering things. And um, I went to see a therapist and I was diagnosed with depression and social anxiety. And uh, what happened was I I ended up in, you know, serious, serious depression, because I would go out in public. And what would happen would be, uh, I would have what I call the zombie panic attacks. And um, I would basically just end up shutting down and sitting in the middle of the floor of the mall, staring at the walls. And I'd have to have ambulance personnel called on me. And eventually my body would, um, you know, I, it would, the, the panic attack would stop, but it took a long time. I, you know, I wouldn't talk to anybody or anything. I, I look kind of like a drug addict, basically just, you know, like I, like I just overdosed on, <laughs> on uh, medication or something like that. And it was very embarrassing for me to go out and be in public because I would have these quote unquote panic attacks. And presumably you didn't necessarily know when they were going to happen. No, I had no idea when they were going to happen. Not at all. I wish I did. So with nothing to predict it. Yeah. yeah, That you say that, that, well, presumably that increases the anxiety anyway. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. As soon as you walk out the door. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've had neuropathy since 2012 in my feet, like I had a like five to seven level pain every single day, I actually got hurt my back got hurt in 1997. Um, I had an accident in 1997. And I've literally been in chronic pain since 1997 from my back. uh, I've had migraines since 1995. So basically, the year that I started college, I, I started having migraines. I had the IBS from when I lived in Pakistan. 
I have had irregular periods since, you know, uh, basically since my cycle started and diagnosed with endometriosis after I had a very large grapefruit size uh, cyst, chocolate cyst removed off of one of my ovaries. Um, and uh, in August of 2017, things were so bad with my health. Um, you know, I had high blood pressure, I had all these, you know, I had constant, constant pain. Um, uh, and uh, in August of 2017, at, at that point, I was so bad that I literally could not walk to my mailbox, which is maybe less than 150 feet without getting winded and having chest pain. And I was like, there's, there's something seriously wrong with me. And I was having two to four, you know, issues a day with my, you know, quote unquote anxiety. And I was like, there, there's got to be, yeah. there's got to be something going on with me, something different and something, this is not right. <laughs> and what had you been told? I mean, because presumably you'd yes. spoken to some doctors about this and oh yes I, I'd had plenty of therapy and plenty of mm. um you know uh, medication and no matter what I did for my quote-unquote anxiety <laughs> and depression like it didn't really seem to cure anything so in October of uh no it was not October it was uh, April of 2005 I got my first service dog for depression and anxiety and um, after several years, I had to retire him and I got a puppy. Uh, and I, at that point, I couldn't find anybody to help me train my own service dog. So uh, I decided to become the resource that I could not find. So this first dog that you had was pre-trained, came to you ready to go. He, he came to me at eight years of age. You know, he was from the Humane Society. He had excellent public access skills. And basically, when I would have my zombie panic attacks, he would lick my face, he would come and sit on my lap, you know, he would basically just engage me kind of out of it. Um, and I had uh, taught this, this next puppy to do the same thing. But it wasn't until I went down and, you know, I actually, I ended up getting my canine studies degree in the state of Washington. Um, there is actually no requirement whatsoever in the entire United States to be a service dog trainer. Like you don't have to have any education. You don't have to have any degree. You don't have to have any, anything in order to call yourself a service dog trainer in the United States. It's really crazy. But um, so I went to this, uh, it got my canine studies degree and uh, in 2009, I went down to a diabetic alert dog training class in California because I am, I am all about continuing education. That's all I, I, I mean, I've, I've attended something like 20 educational conferences since 2008. I'm just kind of like an education junkie. And so I went down there to learn about diabetic alert dog training because, you know, my dad had diabetes, my grandmother had uh, diabetes, my mother's grandmother had diabetes, my mother's mother had diabetes, you know, it was just all in the family. And at the point when I was, I was married to my ex-husband was starting to experience diabetes episodes, his father had diabetes, his mother had diabetes. So it was just like kind of all over in the family. So I'm like, I'm pretty much destined to get this condition. I'm, I might as well go learn how to deal with it, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I went down there to learn about medical alert dog training. And, and within a couple of months of coming back, this dog who had been taught to alert to my ex-husband <laughs> actually started alerting me prior to my quote unquote zombie panic attacks. And I was like, uh -huh. what in the world is going on here? And it turned out that I was having severe hypoglycemia episodes. So you basically got diagnosed by your dog. <laughs> yes, I did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I would have never known that my mental health problems were actually being caused by severe low blood sugar swings. So, um, thank God I, for that dog. I mean, he's the, he's the inspiration for my entire program, my entire train your own service dog program. And, uh, I did lose him, you know, in, in, in uh, June of uh, 2016 to cancer. But, you know, I, I have another alert dog here. I thankfully, you know, now having keto, I don't really have to use him as often as I did before. You know, I actually went from being hypoglycemic, you know, in 2008 to completely full blown diabetic, you know, um, as they say, you know, it takes 10 years for 
your body pretty much has diabetes 10 years before you actually get it. And that was really was the case for me. Like I was having mm-hmm. hypoglycemia episodes, and then I started having high blood sugar episodes, and then I finally went, went into full bone diabetes. So, And what, what was his name, this wonder dog? His name was Liam. And I, I think it means protected guardian. I think that's the, and that's the reason why I chose that name. It's because oh, very. Apt. I, I, that's what I wanted him to be, you know, for me. Yeah. So, I mean, tell me a bit more about this this training because, and it fascinates me. I, I'll admit, I'm I'm absolute crap at training my dogs. My, <laughs> I've, I've never really done any. I mean, I did. They, they kind of do. I was having this conversation with a friend of mine the other day and he said, but they kind of know, they do know your limits. You do this, you know, there's, there's some kind of training going on there, but I've, I've never been good at, you know, training recall and things like that. And where I live, none of that really matters. I don't, I don't need any of it. So all, all I ask of my dogs is that they're just nice dogs, really. Um, but I fully understand the importance of training dogs. Um, but I mean, what I was going to say was from a mental health aspect that I found that my dogs are key to keeping my mood above a level. You know, I, I've suffered from depression for years and I always say they're what saves me from really hitting rock bottom. There's always a level that I think that you're never quite full below when when you've got those dogs to just yes. lift you back up just to be with you. They're there all the time and they're they're such a comfort. Exactly. Um, but you know, no training goes on here. <laughs> There's actually an oxytocin release in your brain when you actually look at your dog too, which it, you know, at that oxytocin is that, you know, pleasure chemical. <laughs> yeah. And you can feel yes, it, can't you? Exactly. Es- especially when they're doing something, you know, I mean, I'm looking at, I, I've got my French bulldog, Bessie, asleep on the bed I'm looking at her and just looking look at oh a little squishy yeah. face and you just you can you but you know you can literally feel that chemical being released yes. when you do it so I I can really understand but okay so that's that's me with with no training but I can see absolutely the benefit that I get from just having the dogs around so it fascinates me that that you can take this on to a next level and bring bring in this this training to really help people you know and I've seen videos of of children with autism being helped all sorts of things and it's you know it's it's mind-blowing and wonderful to watch but how do you go about that process because it seems you know what are the signals they pick up on I can I can see it for for things like I suppose with mental health issues developing I suppose they just pick up on the signals earlier but what happens with um you know, illnesses and with hypos and things, is that purely behavioral or is there something to do with scent or how does it all work? So, um, the, so 40% of your dog's brain is devoted just to your, their nose. So they're basically (laughs) just big noses with dogs attached to the ends of them. (laughs) Which is why they can smell a piece of meat that's dropped on the floor. Two weeks ago. (laughs) Two miles away. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, and there. Um, so if you had a uh, a football field, that's the size of their olfactory capabilities. Our olfactory capabilities is the size of a postage stamp on a football field, and <laughs> they've actually got dogs now that literally go out and find whale poo in the ocean. Like that's their, so they can collect the whale poo and like determine what the whales are eating and how healthy they are. If dogs can find whale poo in the ocean, there is no doubt that they can smell what's going on inside of you, what biochemical changes are happening inside of you. And all we're doing with our training is we're harnessing that. We're harnessing, we're ta- we're teaching them, this is the important smell that you need to come to me and tell me about. And all the other smells that are happening in the environment, just kind of ignore them. So basically, it's kind of the opposite of everything, you know, most dog trainers teach, which is basically don't use your nose, you know, don't sniff anything, (laughs) leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it constantly. And what we're doing is we're teaching, instead, we're teaching, hey, use that nose for my benefit. (laughs) Help me with my medical condition using that wonderful nose that God gave you. 
And, and we have no equipment. We have literally, there is not a single piece of scientific equipment that can recreate the smelling capacity of every dog on the planet. So it's uh, dog noses just absolutely fascinate me. It's pretty well all about the smell. Then. I mean, do they do they watch for things like reactions or as, as well? Or is that just me sort of putting a human spin on it? That's a, that's a human spin. However, you know, there are trainers who um, there are bad trainers who train using kind of body language cues. My training process is getting rid of body language cues. So basically, the, the basic tenets of the, of the training is basically when a person goes low or when they go high, we, they spit on a piece of cotton. And what we do is we pair that smell of that low that's, you know, being exuded out of your body through your breath <laughs> onto your spit. Basically, we take that scent and we pair that with food. And then we pair that that smell of that. It's basically Pavlovian conditioning from high school. Do you remember Pavlovian conditioning? Yeah. Uh, ring the bell, feed the dogs, ring the bell, feed the dogs, ring the bell, feed the dogs, ring the bell, the dog starts to drool. It's the same thing. So we just pair up the scent of the low blood sugar with food. And we do that over and over and over and over again. And then we pair that with a trick. And for my dogs, the trick is to paw for a low and spin in a circle for a high. So these dogs can detect sometimes 20 to 30 minutes before a meter can detect a low blood sugar or a high blood sugar, which allows a diabetic to keep their um, blood sugar in a normal range. So, uh, you know, we're not talking people going into 400, you know, 500, 600 level uh, blood sugar levels before they actually notice it. We're talking about keeping blood sugars in a quote unquote therapeutic range uh, using a dog's nose. Exactly. So I can I can see that. Yeah. So they're basically just giving you that heads up. So when you notice it is 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 too not too late, but you know, getting to be too late. So yes. it's when when a human notices it's oh crap, I've got to do something about mm-hmm. this straight away. Yep. Whereas the dog can tell you before so you can you can take yes. a preemptive strike to it actually happening at all. Exactly. Because when your blood sugar goes low, you your mental faculties kind of disappear. And uh, you don't think about eating food or, you know, any type of food is just abhorrent to you at that point. You know, I, I don't want to eat. So it's a double whammy. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, it's, yeah, it really is, you know. And so what happens is these dogs can tell you before you get to that point. You know, we don't want dogs alerting when you're comatose. We want dogs alerting when you're, you actually have enough mental capacity to actually deal with it yourself and prevent yourself from getting to the point where you need to call an ambulance. Mm -hmm. So that's what these dogs do. They save people's lives by preventing them from, you know, like I had a student who had 13 visits by an ambulance (laughs) in one year and it went from 13 visits one year, I think he got his medical alert dog trained, he went down to one visit in one year. And that's because he was locked in a hotel room and the dog, you know, um, was locked in the hotel room with him and couldn't get him out of the hotel room because he'd never been trained. He was only nine months old. So like the, the dogs are just absolutely amazing in their capacity to be able to smell and help diabetics. Mm -hmm. And and does it work the same way with other things that you're training them for? Mm -hmm. So for things like, you know, mental health disorders or all the other service dogs that are out there, does it it always work the same way or slightly different? Well, I I use positive reinforcement training. So I I use food. Uh, The vast majority of really good trainers are going to be using positive reinforcement training because we don't want our dogs scared of us. Um, The type of training that I do, however, with my dogs is I also teach intelligent disobedience, which is not necessarily taught to mobility dogs or, um, uh, you know, other types of service dogs, because, uh, you know, again, what happens when your when your blood sugar goes low is your brain tells you. You know, like I push, I, when I was low, I pushed my dog off of me. I would say, get alone, get away, leave me alone, you know, get off of me. I'll deal with it later. You know, I just, and so I have to teach my dog to come back over and over again and disobey me. And, uh, you know, that's not something that you necessarily teach a dog who is helping someone who, uh, you know, needs the dog to go get the walker or needs the dog to, you know, go grab the phone for them or something like that. So it, it, there, it, and the other thing too is about uh, medical alert dog training is uh, we are teaching the dog 
to, it's, it's completely opposite of all the other trainings because we're teaching the dog to respond to a situation without being prompted to do so. Like all of the other service dogs, they're always being told what to do. Mm -hmm. Go get the phone, you know, go go do this, go do that. With a medical alert dog. This is all about them using their initiative, isn't it? Yes. the, The dog has to spontaneously in any situation that they're in go, I'm smelling that smell. Now I need to go contact my owner, find my owner and tell them about it. And so the, the type of training that we do is kind of completely opposite in, for medical alert than we do for other types of service dogs. So presumably then it's very specific to the disorder and the person you're training the dog for. So, you know, you've explained how that works for diabetes and they'll have, um, you know, particular things that they then do to alert to whether it's high or low and what you were saying about this selective disobedience I can see yeah I can see exactly how that works how does it work with uh you know something completely different like autism say that presumably would be a whole different set of training skills well I actually don't work with autism service dogs so dog trainers service dog trainers are kind of like lawyers you know we kind of all have our specialty my specialty is medical alert dogs so I do diabetes seizures narcolepsy POTS uh, AFib um, and uh, I think I, I think I covered and diabetes basically so mm-hmm. um, but you know, I'm not an expert in autism service dogs, mostly because I don't have, I've never had children <laughs> and I, I don't really understand children, <laughs> you know, the care of children. And so I never felt like I would, I could be comfortable um, helping someone with an autistic child. So that's why I've chosen to keep out of the autism service dog training. And plus there's, again, this industry is not regulated whatsoever. And there are a lot of people out there who are scamming people and it's a, mm-hmm. it's a really sad fact uh, that this industry isn't regulated. I you know I, I wish I could give you information about autism, but I just you know I'm not an expert. No, it in makes it. sense. I was I mean I was plucking that out the air really. I suppose what started me along that train of thought was when you were saying that you you know you originally had your your first service dog for the social anxiety yes. issues that you had. Mm-hmm. So, you know, more of a mental health disorder. And then you spoke about training your next dog. But but then it it turned out was see that I suppose and that would have been a better example to use rather than autism, which is something completely different. I suppose what I was trying to get at was is there a difference in those two kind of trainings, or did it just happen that you were without knowing training your dog to be a diabetes medical alert dog do you, Do you see what I'm saying? Well, the issue with um the first dog was that it it would never was never able to tell me before something would happen. So with the, with the diabetic alert dog training, the dog is able to give me a warning beforehand. So I never end up sitting in the middle of a mall, staring at the wall, having the the paramedics called on me because I look like a drug addict who's zoned out on opiates. You know, it's very embarrassing situation to be in. Um, Thankfully, you know, once I started having a dog and going out in public with the dog, you know, it was more like, oh, she has a medical issue versus she's a drug addict, you know, because a lot of diabetics, they get labeled drug addicts, because they, you know, their blood sugar causes bipolar like, you know, uh, episodes. Uh, And my ex called me a rapid cycling bipolar, you know, at some point, because I'm like, I'm like, please explain to me, how rapid cycling bipolar can actually be fixed by drinking a Coca-Cola. <laughs> it just doesn't work like that. You know, I was, you know, at that point when I was, you know, still with my ex at that point, I hadn't been completely diagnosed as diabetic yet. So, you know, I, I, I had been having these hypoglycemia episodes and he saw my dog alerting to them. He saw me um, recovering from them, but yet somehow he didn't believe that I was, you know, I, it was truly the diabetes that was causing this and not Mm -hmm. this, you know, mental health issue that I was diagnosed with. So that I guess is, is, is what I was trying to get at that you were thinking you were training it for one thing, but actually you were, you were training it without knowing the dog knew better. Yes, the dog was (laughs) was actually training you as a diabetes (laughs) alert 
Fascinating. I mean, it, it sounds like a very rewarding career. Yes. You must you must really enjoy it. Like I made less than nine thousand dollars last year. That's literally that's all that I made last year. And I don't care. You know, I really don't care. I I love helping people and I love working with dogs so much. I'm actually allergic to dogs. I had no eight way. years of allergy shots to be allergic to to, you know, be able to handle dogs. And still, if a dog licks my face, I get hives all over my face still. So like, uh, I am basically killing myself <laughs> slowly by doing this job. But I love it so much. Because, you know, I have been in their position, I've been in that position of, of being so disabled, you know, I had like 39 sick days the last time I had a full time job. Uh, I mean, no one wants to hire someone who has 39 sick days in their in their history. So and that was just one year, just 39 sick days in one year. So I, I know what it's like to be chronically ill and chronically in pain. And I want to do as much as possible to help people get out of that. Is this something you teach as well? I mean, you, you actually do the, the hands-on training yes. of the dogs, but do you, 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 you teach other people how to do it as well, do you? Yes, yes. I had a trainer fly in from Spain. Um, I have trainers who come into my classes. And, you know, I've spoken at conferences with 6,000 other dog trainer members, <laughs> organizations. So, you know, I, I've shared my knowledge. I've actually started to notice my, my, uh, my email list. I have, I have an email list for my business. And uh, I've started to notice that like the email addresses in my, <laughs> my list are starting to be, you know, love my dog at, you know, train your dog at this place.com, you know, <laughs> so like dog trainers are actually starting to pop onto my email list versus the, the chronically ill people as well. So yeah, I, I do work with uh, I, I help other dog trainers learn how to train medical alert and I help people train their own dogs for medical alert. And then I also have, I'm starting now that I've started keto now that I have energy. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited about this. About, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying not to clap my hands to ruin the audio here, <laughs> but like I am, I have so much energy now that I'm starting a puppy raising program in my community. So my next litter of puppies will go out into the community and people will have to come back to me every week, you know, with their puppy and we'll do training with them and stuff. And I, I, I would have never been able to do this prior to keto. There's no, I would have never had enough energy to have people come into my house, you know, have, have people calling me all hours of the day and night going, I don't know what's wrong with this puppy. Please help me with this puppy. You know, I'd have never had the energy to deal with the, you know, the issues that surround having eight puppies in a community that I am responsible for. But now that I'm on a ketogenic diet and I have the energy level that has come with this and the mental clarity that's come with this and the lack of, you know, up and down constant bipolarish blood sugar swings that I was having all the time, you know, I am, I'm going to be able to start a puppy raising program and help even more people. That sounds interesting. And uh, well, I mean, who doesn't love puppies? So it sounds like great fun as well. But uh, a friend of mine, Claire in New Zealand actually was, was talking about, she'd been having a conversation, I can't remember whether she was approached by this person or she'd been having a conversation anyway, with being one of the families that these, these puppies go to so um for for her benefit <laughs> and for everyone who loves puppies you know how does that process work so is, is it are you you um are raising the puppies with a dog you have i say raising the puppies getting the puppies to the point where they can go to the homes and then you place them in these homes and then there's some kind of ongoing training between you and the families how does that work so what will happen is they will go home to the you know person that I've chosen but these puppies they're puppies that you would have raised from one of your dogs yes uh, yes so one of my pup my dogs will have puppies and they will go at eight weeks of age to a person in the community um, they will have to come every week to classes and learn how to, you know, sit down, stay, all of the obedient stuff. We'll talk about all the socialization that needs to happen. Like we need to go to train stations. We need to get them on buses. We need to get them, you know, going out in the city. We need to take them to the, you know, the Six Flags amusement parks. We need to take them places. So there will be weekly meetings for the first six months and then 
biweekly meetings after that and up until they're about a year and a half of age. And at that point, they will be evaluated to see whether or not they are suitable for service work. Now, hopefully with all the training and the socialization that these people have done with the dogs, then I will take them back in and I will do the actual task training and the actual um, finishing of the service dog training. But uh, it's, I can't do it with, without these puppy raisers. I mean, it's, and, and if you are in the St. Louis metropolitan area and you are looking to give back to the, uh, you know, the diabetics in your community or even people with disabilities in your community, I highly encourage you to contact me because I, you know, I need puppy raisers at this point because, you know, they are the people who are going, you know, you're going to get free information on, on dog training, number one. Number two, the other thing that happens too is if the dog ends up failing, you get a free labradoodle. <laughs> <laughs> so you get to keep the dog. And sometimes the dog can fail for good reasons. Like the dog's way too friendly with people, you know? So it, it, it doesn't always all bad reasons that a dog fails. It could be that, you know, the dog has uh, food allergies or something like that. We can't, we can't sell a dog to somebody that has food allergies. You know, it's just, it, that's a too big of a, uh, or, or flea allergies or something like that. You can't, you can't have a service dog going to Florida with flea allergies. It just doesn't work. So, you know, sometimes these dogs, uh, will drop out of a program for a, you know, kind of a good reason versus a, a negative reason. And then you get a free Labradoodle, which is like a, you know, $3,000 dog. And you've got this amazing dog that has public access skills and is able to, you know, behave in, in, uh, you know, exceptionally well and in all environments. So it's it's a kind of a really nice trade off. It sounds like a very rewarding uh, thing to do and a very noble thing to do. I know that I, uh, well, I'm pretty confident that I'm not the kind of person who'd be able to give it up at that. Yeah. What eighteen month mark? That must be an incredibly tough thing to do when you've you know you've not only bonded with this dog but you've you've had this extra bonding process with all the training I mean I suppose you go into it knowing that but that's gosh that would be difficult not to fall but in love completely the dog gets to go save someone's life I know every day. it's, a, it's <laughs> like, an incredible payoff I just yeah. I don't I don't know that I could do it <laughs> I it, su- but I suppose that's the thing that you train yourself yes. at the same time throughout yep. the process that you are doing this for this incredible reason and that's what is going to happen at the end. Mm-hmm. And presumably when you've when you've proved yourself as a fantastic medical alert puppy trainer you get to do it again with another one. Exactly, exactly. You get re- uh you know hopefully by that time, you know, we sh- we should have another puppy for you within a couple of months of the um, you know, me taking the dog back. And the other thing too, is like, you know, I'm, I'm just one person here and, and I can make up my own rules. So if you want to have contact with that dog, you know, uh, every six months and you want to go meet them for coffee or lunch and I, heck, let's, 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 let's let you do that. You know, I can see that being a great follow up actually, because when, when, or as hard as it would be seeing that dog performing the function that you've been key in developing seeing what it's what it's actually doing in its new new life situation that 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 would probably be the the thing that healed the (laughs) the deep scars you had from having to give up the puppy (laughs) amazing what what amazing projects you have and we've I mean we've been talking all about the dogs because well we both love dogs and it's fascinating but Tell me about you now and and was it a case of once you found out about the diabetes that was what that was the turning point with with what switched you on to keto how did that come about I wish it was that easy like I spent uh years doing extensive damage to my body um you know, I, I literally have neuropathy in my feet at this point. I'm 40 years old and I have five years of damage, of neuropathy damage in my feet already. And uh, it, I, I was facing, you know, eventually a foot amputation if I didn't do something about my diabetes. And 
the way that I actually learned about um, uh, the ketogenic diet actually was, first off, it started out in August of 2017. I started um, praying to God, asking him how I could get closer to him. And I actually heard fasting. And I was like, oh my, this is the devil talking to me. Diabetics can't fast. (laughs) They die if they fast, you know? So, um, but I was watching the Jim Baker show. uh, And uh, for those of you who know about Jim Baker in the United States, he's actually back on TV and he talks about prepping. And as a, you know, a daughter of a law enforcement officer, I'm kind of sort of, you know, into prepping a little bit. And uh, he had a doctor called Don Colbert on there who was talking about the ketogenic diet. And I was like, no, there's no way this can this can actually work. And so I started Googling uh, about keto. I didn't buy the guy's book <laughs> off of the uh, site. Was he talking about it specifically to help with diabetes? Yes, he was talking about the ketogenic his, his diet. His book is called uh, The Keto Diet, I think it's called. And uh, it was talking about how you can basically reverse diabetes, reverse migraines, you know, all of these health conditions can be reversed utilizing a ketogenic diet. And I'd never been like, you know, I was a tomboy as a kid, you know, and I never really cared very much about my looks or anything like that. I was a girly girl. I never really did a bunch of dieting when I was growing up, even though I was consistently overweight all of my life. I never really focused on my physical image. So um, I really didn't care very much about dieting. But when I started to hear that I could reverse my diabetes with diet, and because no matter what medication they were giving me, you know, it doesn't, it wasn't working. It wasn't controlling my foot pain. It wasn't controlling my blood sugar. Nothing was working. So um, I started Googling. And you just hear that term progressive over and yes, over again, don't exactly. you say, well, this is just going to keep getting worse. Yes. So. And that's what it, that's what happened to my father. Like it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse and, and more medical problems on one medical problem on top of another medical problem. And the medication that they give you gives you another medical problem. I mean, he's, he's literally had almost an entire page of diagnoses from, you know, his, from the time that the, in Pakistan, the the damage that was done to his body through all the chemicals that were giving him being constantly stressed out, being a law enforcement officer and, uh, you know, all of the incredibly bad food habits that he had. So, and yeah, again, he also had type two diabetes as well. But, uh, you know, I eventually found uh, Jimmy Moore's podcast. Uh, I found the Fasting Talk podcast that he did. And that eventually led to the Two Keto Dudes podcast as well. So I did a ton of research about this because, as, as I told you before, I'm very much into education. I am like an educated Nazi. I love education. And um, I was like, I'm going to do this. So in October of 2017, I started a ketogenic diet and I started out just like everyone else does. I tried to ketify everything, all of the my favorite food recipes. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I've, you know, I've gotten out of that now. Uh, but um, you know, like the first two weeks were kind of bad because I was de- I was literally dealing with a sugar addiction. As you know, sugar mm-hmm. they've shown that sugar is eight times more addictive than cocaine. And I was talking to one of my dad's DEA friends, and I was like, I don't know about this whole drug. Thing, you know, like they're putting drug addicts in, in jail. Really, I think they should be working on sugar instead of drugs at this point. They should not be feeding children sugar because I have been suffering for years with this medical condition, uh, you know, and it's been, affected my mental health just as much as any, you know, drug that's on, that's on your illegal drug schedule. And um, he didn't want to talk about that so much, but, you know, (laughs) but yeah, I have, you know, the first two weeks were kind of bad because I was dealing with sugar addiction. But after that, I, I, I went from two to four low blood sugars a day to one or two every week, which is a substantial difference. And uh, I didn't instantly like a lot of people, you know, they go on a ketogenic diet and they're like, oh, I instantly feel immediately better. And that was not my case. You know, I have had, I've been so sick for so long that, you know, like I really think it took about five full months for the ketogenic diet to, I mean, I was consistently losing weight, which was nice. You know, that I, I really didn't care about the losing weight thing. I cared about the fact that I went from two to five migraines a month to one with now in eight months, you know, my blood sugars were 
were normalized. My mood was stabilized <laughs> because my blood weren't going up and down. You know, um, my endometriosis, uh, it, like the constant pain that I had with my periods was, uh, it's gone. Uh, my periods have normalized. Uh, I, I used to go like every two, three months without a period. Uh, and uh, my IBS got better. And, you know, my neuropathy went from a level of five to seven, sometimes eight level pain every single day to uh, I'm like maybe a one or two. Uh, I can wear normal shoes now again. My neighbors used to make fun of me in the winter. They're like, why are you wearing Tevas out here? And I'm like, my feet hurt so much. I can't wear normal shoes. You know, I'm, I'm walking in the middle of the winter in Tevas. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but you know, like I'm, I'm so excited about all of these changes that have happened in my body because of ketogenic diet that I just had to share it with, you know, my students. Well, I mean, it's obvious really, isn't it? Because it goes hand in hand. I mean, you know, you're you're training these dogs to alert their humans to this condition, but you also have the power to advise the humans from from their end what they can do to yeah. you know not necessarily make the dogs completely redundant but certainly you know that they're, they're not going to need to be alerting them so much so, I, mean, I mean why wouldn't you want to share that it's a it's a powerful accompaniment to what you do isn't it yes Put you out of a job a bit, maybe, but in a good way. <laughs> I don't care. I really don't. I don't care. I would much rather be the last resort than be the first thing that they choose to do. Mm. Because, you know, just cause, because I've been in their shoes. I've been in chronic pain since 1997. I know what it's like to to have uh, paramedics treat you like a drug addict, to have people think that you're some crazy person because your blood sugar is going low, or there's something medically wrong with you. Like I deal with narcoleptics, you know, who pass out, uh, you know, with sleep attacks, you know, in the middle of the mall, and they get treated like, like drug addicts, like they're the scum of the earth. And uh, I know what I've been there, I know what it's like. And I would much rather have my students utilize diet now that I've seen the results of what a ketogenic diet do, I would much rather have them have be use that to manage their medical condition than spend a ton of money with me, you know, and uh, train their own dog uh, to try to alert them to their blood sugars because, you know, a ketogenic diet is going to do much more for you to prevent you from getting your feet lopped off than a medical alert dog will ever do. Exactly. In- incredible. And so tell me a bit about what your what your day-to-day keto looks like now. You said you sort of started with, and I bet you went out like 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 we all did and a great long list of all those fancy ingredients to make yep. everything under the sun and to be honest you know it's still fun to do that from time to time but it's a, it's a lot of energy isn't it was it it sounds like you're probably on a bit more of a simple day to day now yeah like initially i i was you know i put stevia and everything i i've actually actually not had a very good reaction to fake sugars uh anytime i uh, eat a fake sugar it literally feels like I am peeing fire. So like, uh, you know, I had to basically just finally go, okay, I have to just stop this fake sugar stuff and just start to eat, um, you know, uh, low carb fruits, like berries. And, um, you know, that's basically my, that's my sugar basically there is berries. That's that's all that I eat really (laughs) uh, for sugar. Uh, But you know, I did start out trying to do the ketify everything, but it just really didn't work with me because of the fact that my body just reacts so negatively to those, those fake sugar alcohols because of all of I'm sure it's probably because of all the processing that goes into it. You know, no, you know, I have no qualms against anybody else using them. They were just not right for my body. So, and, and my keto now every day, it just depends on what's going on. I, and sometimes I intermittently fast. Uh, sometimes I, you know, I've, I've actually started fasting. Uh, the longest fast that I've done is 6.5 days. That's, I have to have, have to add the point. <laughs> oh, there. of course. Point five is important. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I eat pork belly, you know, and, and the interesting thing too about keto is that I never liked vegetables before I started keto, but now I'm like, oh, I, I bought a package of Brussels sprouts at the store a couple of days ago. And I'm like, I wonder what these would taste like with a bunch of fat on it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yummy, yummy. And it was really good. I just sauteed them with, uh, some, 
garlic and uh, onion powder and some um, rice wine vinegar and olive oil. And I was like, oh my God, these taste great, you know? And I've actually started craving vegetables, which is totally you know, like vegetables in my house when I was a kid, it was like, you have to eat your vegetables. It was a forced thing. And now I just can't wait to have them. They're, they're, they taste so good because I get to load them up with fat <laughs> and salt and, and, and cheese. And it's, it's, it makes it so much yummier. Isn't it funny how, you know, you're, you're eating these things and you're thinking as you're eating them, you know, oh my God, this is so delicious. And then another part of your brain that in the past would be loading on the guilt and the shame when you were yes. saying, oh my God, this is so delicious because it was a tub of haagen or something. Now <laughs> it's firing on all cylinders and dancing around in the sunshine saying, and it's healthy. And it, you know, you're really enjoying that. Yeah. And we don't have to punish you at the same time and make you feel bad about it. <laughs> so it's like this double hit that's this incredible high <laughs> that you're enjoying what you're eating and it's good for you. I am so excited that every evening I get to end my evening with like a, a third of a cup of berries full of of cream with chopped up um, 88% dark chocolate. I mean, that is like my most favoritest thing in the entire world. I get to end my evening with a dessert that is so delicious <laughs> and and I don't get to I don't feel any guilt whatsoever about eating it. You know, and before I felt guilty about eating sweets and eating desserts, but now it's like this is this is totally part of my everyday life now that I get to eat something sweet and fat at the same time and I and and as long as I keep my carbohydrates under like 20 or 30 a day, I don't have um, my neuropathy doesn't come back. I mean, I, I, I actually in April of uh, 2018, I went to Seattle and I actually um, ate some macaroni and cheese from Beecher's, which is like the best macaroni and cheese in the entire world. And what happened was I, I, I ate non-keto because I was traveling for three days. Within 24 hours, my neuropathy came back. My eczema on my hands came back. Uh, and I was like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> like I, I, this, this pain is so horrible to go from one to two level pain every single day to go to, you know, a, a five to seven level pain in your feet. I was like, I am never eating this ever again. And now I have to think about Okay, now now I'm prepping, you know, I'm a prepper and now I got to go through all that that food downstairs that I have in my basement and go, I don't know if I'm going to even eat that <laughs> if the world ends. I'm going to be fasting <laughs> because I am not going to eat that standard American diet stuff anymore because it has such a negative effect on my body. It, it within 24 hours of eating and standard American diet, you know, I think I had macaroni and cheese, I had a grilled cheese and I think I had a brownie you know, and, and, and some water and maybe a Coke. And like within 24 hours, my feet were on fire again. Kind of good to see that, isn't it? I mean, it's, you know, no one's ever going to recommend that you go out and have those kind of things that you've been avoiding because you've been avoiding them for your health. But actually, really educational experience to yes. show you Bam, just what the consequences are, because especially when you haven't been having those things for such a long time, you become so sensitive to them mm -hmm. that, like you were saying, you know, within 24 hours, you've got a real resurgence. You can really see that direct consequence exactly. very significantly, which is a great reminder to have going forward, isn't it? Yes, because I know that I will never eat the standard American diet ever again. I don't I don't care what happens. I will never do that ever again. It's just, it's just too painful for me. F physically too painful for me. And what about your dogs? Are your dogs on keto too? <laughs> okay. So uh, what's really funny about this is that, it, you know, for years I have been preaching more meat, more meat. Dogs, dogs are carnivores. They are not cornivores. <laughs> they, they're not supposed <laughs> no. to be eating corn. They're not supposed to be eating wheat, soy. And they're supposed they, they have canine teeth for a reason. It's to tear flesh. <laughs> so, um, you know, I had been applying this, you know, all of my students, I always talk about how important diet is and helping your dog with their 
their actual energy level and their moods and stuff by eat, you know putting more meat into your dog's diet, giving your dog coconut oil to help with their skin. And little did I know that this this nutritional information that I had been giving my dog training students for their dogs was so important for myself as well. Should have just applied it to you. Should have just eaten what the dog was eating. <laughs> exactly. I should have eaten my dog food, basically. Yes. I probably would have been healthier, sadly. So, yeah. So the answer is yes, then, by the sounds of it. They're, they're keto, too. Uh, well, they, they aren't full keto, but uh, they're as keto as you, you can be uh, making $9,000 a year. You know, I mean, I have to do what I can. I, 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 I have so much energy now that I started a garden. And so I will be feeding my dog some of the, the fruits and vegetables that are grown in my garden. And, uh, you know, um, I'm planning on hopefully hunting for the first time this year and getting my own meat uh, so that I can feed that to them as well and, and me as well. So, you know, keto has, has kind of changed my perception about food and how, it, you know, how what goes in my body and how it affects me. People talk about hunter-gatherer diets. You're literally going to yes. become a hunter-gatherer. <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. Sounds like a great plan. So it sounds to me like you've got lots of fabulous ideas going forward with I mean what you've what you've been doing and enjoying already, but you've you've got new products that you're you're looking to start. So you're you're hoping to start this this puppy raising project. When when's that likely to start? So uh my female will probably go into heat within the next two months. It's Two months after that, the puppies are delivered, and two months after that, they get to go back to their homes to They're the puppy long. raiser. So it's it's not long. I gotta I got a while before I uh, have puppies. But uh, you know, again, if you're in the St. Louis area and you would like to help save the life of a diabetic who doesn't necessarily know about keto and how it can help them, <laughs> uh, then uh, please contact me. And again, uh, my business ad. Um, business name is Service Dog Academy. All you have to do is Google me. Well, we'll have all the details in the show notes as well. So it'd be very easy for people to find you. But um, you you mentioned that you do training courses as well. Are there yes. things you do online? Yes. You mentioned that people, you know, trainers and people are contacting you from all over the world. You know, what what kind of services can you offer people if they're not in your town that you can directly deal with? So I teach in-person classes. I teach four-day in-person classes. So people fly in for four days and they learn how to train their own dog for medical alert. I have an online training program for people outside of the area or who can't necessarily afford to fly into classes. Like I have students in Australia. I have students in England and Spain and Germany and Switzerland and Brazil and Mexico, Canada, people from all over the world have used my wow. online programming. The beauty of the internet, it's truly international. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And the other thing that I also do too is, you know, the um, I'm starting now to produce Labradoodles uh, for the service dog program. And if you are interested in a Labradoodle too, I, um, you know, I will be selling several Labradoodles out of that litter to help support the service dog program. So if you oh, are interested in getting idea. a Labradoodle, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. like there is no one like a service dog trainer to raise a puppy prior to eight weeks of age. Mm. I mean, we do so much to these dogs. We take them, we, uh, eight week old puppies, you know, like they have, they have had interactions at the nursing home. We have the boy scouts come over. We do prioception exercises with them. We do early uh, introduction and, and uh, neurological stimulation with them. You know, prior to uh, eight weeks of age, 10 million brain cells are being made or taken away from a dog uh, during the first uh, eight weeks of its life. Every week, 10 million brain cells are being made or taken away. So if all... Oh, wow. So all those kind of stimuli are really, really important. It, it literally, like, it literally magnifies their brain. And that presumably is one of the huge differences, apart from the fact that they're not very well cared for from any point of view, but... That presumably is one of the massive differences between a puppy farm puppy and just a puppy that that isn't even isn't even in a household like 
yours, but just has been raised in a caring household. They haven't necessarily stimulated them to the level you have, yes. but they're going to be infinite better than these puppy farm dogs. But the puppies that you're producing are just on a different level because they've had these all these stimuli right yes. from the exactly. get-go. Yes, we, we're talking like within hours of being born, we put scent on mommy's nipples. So they smell the smell of the low blood sugar while they're, they're suckling mommy's nipples. So it, it like imprints the scent into their brain. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many things that could be done prior to eight weeks of age. It's like when you're, when you're a kid, you can learn a language at a snap you know, but mm -hmm. when you're 40 years old, it takes you forever to learn a new language. So dogs are the same way, you know, uh, prior to five months of age, they can learn things so quickly. But once we hit that five months of age mark, there's literally a biochemical change that happens in their in their brain. Uh, it's called the fear period. And if you haven't set the groundwork prior to five months of age, it's very difficult to get them to be a service dog afterwards. Right. So I recommend people come to me as early as possible with their with their um, dogs. And, and if you are going to get a dog, I actually have a free one and a half hour lecture on my website for anybody who's looking for, if you don't want a Labradoodle, just watch my free webinar on how to find a breeder who is doing the same stuff that I do because breeders can literally do brain damage to your dog by not doing the proper amount of socialization. They need to meet at least 100 people prior to going home. Like a lot of breeders are like, oh, we don't want people in our house. Oh, they could contaminate and stuff like that. Well, if you do maternal antibody testing before the uh, puppies are born, then you know that the, the puppies are completely safe from parvo and December or anything else that people could bring in on their clothing. And you can safely interact with these dogs with the public if you have maternal antibody testing done. But, you know, the vast majority of backyard breeders are not doing this. They're not doing how I mean, today, I'm literally going to the vet and I'm spending probably at least $400 on hip and elbow x-rays for the father of the uh, puppy litter to make sure that I am breeding healthy, temperamentally stable puppies. And we're not putting out mm -hmm. puppies into the world that are going to be sick and, uh, you know, and, and causing problems for people versus saving their lives. That sounds like a fantastic resource for for people to go look at. We'll, it's totally we'll free. Make sure, yeah, we'll make sure we'll have links for that. Um, I, I, you mentioned, you know, uh, looking for you know other breeders that do this how, how many how many people are there in the states that are doing it to the level you're doing it specifically oh. for diabetes medical alert um well i'm one of the top medical alert dog trainers in the country and i'd say there's probably maybe 10 people in the united states that i would trust to be at the same mm. level that i am they're not very many no yeah. they're not very many not at all i wish there were more but this industry, unfortunately, again, because you, there's no education requirement whatsoever, and these dogs cost so much money. There are people who are going into this field thinking, oh, my God, I can make $25,000 on a dog. But what they don't realize is that, you know, I could go through four dogs before I get a good service dog <laughs> out of a dog. So it really is not a profit-making scheme. You have to do this because you you you've been here <laughs> or you, you, you literally are here to change people's lives, not to make money off of this. It sounds like maybe this is another path you need to think about taking is bringing in legislation and getting those rules and regulations changed yeah. and presumably also perhaps getting, you know, involved. I mean, I think you already mentioned that you're already involved in training the trainers, but, yes. you know, when, when you're when you're in the in the top 10 it's at some point it's going to become a responsibility probably and with all this newfound energy yes. to train the trainers and make sure that there are more than 10 make sure there are 100 that you can trust a thousand that you can trust and if you would have said that uh, to me a year ago I would have said no way because I, mm. I wouldn't have had the energy to do that but now, but now. <laughs> that I'm on keto I mean it's not it's not like I'm like I'm hopping out of bed every single morning going I can't wait what to do but like when I actually get, get, get you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. But now when I actually go out and do something, I can do it for, you know, I went out and I worked in my garden for almost eight hours straight. <laughs> and before I literally would have been out there for 30 minutes and probably would have passed out afterwards. So like I, I have immeasurable amounts of energy once I get going on doing something. <laughs> and an so, incredibly short period of time. I mean, you said, what, what did you say? Was it October? To, to, I mean, yep. you know, 
it's been life changing for me. What we took six months or something. I mean, it's nothing, is it? Incredible. That's why I had to share my story. It's just yeah. literally been. I've been chronically ill since 1997, and to have this, to have this diet, literally make 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 me go from a completely disabled person, to, you know, who literally had to use a service dog every day to manage her life, to a person who now has the energy to devote time to legislation to devote time to helping other disabled people to devote time to even helping more people than I was doing before. And the reason why I, you know, part of the reason why I started this program too, was because I was not like, I was not reliably employable. Because of all of my illnesses, I was not reliably employable. You know, 39 sick days in one year, no one wants you as an employee when you have 39 sick days in one year. But now that I'm on keto, and now that my health has has taken a complete 180, I'm like, I need to do as much as possible now mm, to help pay people it feel better. Big time. And, and 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 if they you know aren't going to be changing their diet, then I'm going to help them save their lives with the use of a medical alert dog. I'm going to change the way the world works. And when you mentioned Labradoodle, and I know a, a little bit about those, I know a few people who have them. And with, did you choose that breed because of the issues with being, you know, with allergies? Yes. Because they're hypoallergenic, aren't they? So, Like when my ex-husband asked me what I wanted in life, I told him I wanted two things. I wanted a yellow lab named Lucy <laughs> a, a chocolate lab named Bella. That's all I wanted out of life. I don't. I didn't care about big fancy cars. I didn't care about you know, big houses with picket fences. All I wanted my entire life was a yellow lab named Lucy and a chocolate lab named Bella. And unfortunately, you know, I, I'm such a lab lover. I mean, I love labs so much, but my asthma is getting to the point where it's so bad that I need to, to start to move into more hypoallergenic breeds because of that. And because I am allergic, I literally am allergic to dogs, <laughs> but I don't care. I, I am going to w- continue working with dogs as long as I can, as long as I'm physically able to do so, I will work with dogs for the rest of my life. This is my passion. You know, I, I will do nothing else. <laughs> but the ones that are actually in your house all the time, you don't have an issue with now from that point of view no I do oh you still do I still do if they lick my face if they lick my face oh yeah I will have hives all over my face if my hands my hands are um don't really get hives on them uh if they scratch me I'll get hives you know like I I do still have allergies to them so it's just the hair that doesn't set it off other things do it's actually not the hair so the hair is not what causes the allergy it's actually the saliva so in order to actually have a hypoallergenic allergenic dog you have to have a salivalist dog <laughs> but what we've they found is that the poodle is less allergenic than uh, other breeds so that's right. why i've chosen to move into labradoodles is because there's the potential for me to be able to breathe better i assumed it was all down to the hair and it's something i'm sure i read nope. somewhere about lack of shedding or something that's all just a bit of a myth then by the sounds of it it's yeah, all it's to do with the saliva, saliva and poodles having mm-hmm. Less problematic. How yep. fascinating. Well, I, I love learning something new every day. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I helped. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it's been fantastic talking to you about this today. Perhaps you can wrap up with a top tip for the listeners. Well, uh, as I told you guys, um, I started this journey uh, because I asked how to get closer to God. And God told me to start fasting. I thought it was the devil talking, but God told me to start fasting. And my recommendation is to, if you're on a ketogenic diet, just maybe try fasting. You know, maybe try fasting for 12 hours and see what happens. See what happens to your body. And eventually, you might start to enjoy it. Because, you know, there, there has been scientific studies. There was that one fasting study that was done in, uh, I think it was last year, that if you fast for four days, you like increase your pancreatic beta cells, which are the cells that help produce insulin. So like, you know, fasting has the ability to not, not only ketogenic living, but the, the combination of ketogenic and fasting really has the ability to help heal your body. And um, since God was the one that told me to do it, I'm going to share that with with your audience. And I'm going to recommend that you do exactly what Megan Ramos says to do, which is just 
start out slowly, build that fasting muscle, you know, don't don't try and do a, a seven day fast the first time that you do this, do exactly what I did, start out small and work your way up. And we did kind of skip over that. You've, you've reminded me from from saying that. What was the timing with you thinking about fasting and then that television program you watched? Did they happen to come at about the same time or did you, did you tr- experiment with the fasting for a while and then the ketogenic bit came in later? No. So I, lear- I, I heard God tell me to fast in August of 2017. I learned about ketogenic diets in October of 2017. I learned about fasting in October of 2017. And it took me about three months before I felt like I was safe enough to actually try a fast. I so, see. Um, so it was just a bit of a stack fasting. of things yes. that, that came at sort of pretty well at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And what a difference. What a what a change in direction your life took at that point. Exactly. Amazing. Exactly. Well, it's it's been an honor and a privilege talking Thank to you. someone who pays it forward with the energy and the verve, the kindness and compassion that you do. Thank you so much for sharing all that with me today. And thank you for having me on. I, I love sharing my story. Uh, you know, I, I, I just, I want people to be healthy because I've been there. I've just, I've been in pain all day, every day. And it's, it's so nice to no longer be in pain and to have a body that is actually functional and be a normal person. I can't wait to see what another year on keto does for you. <laughs> your your energy is going to be boundless. <laughs> you will have changed all the legislation. You will be the top trainer in the country. N- not the country, the world. The world. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. And we'll be seeing you on every chat show across across the world, I'm sure. <laughs> that, thank you so much, Mary. Yeah. We'll talk to you soon. To get the resources and links from the show, please go to ketowomanpodcast.com. Are you my next extraordinary woman? Maybe you've got an idea for a show, a topic you want to hear about. Let me know how I can tickle your earbuds by dropping me a line at daisy at ketowomanpodcast.com. If you fancy joining me on this exciting adventure and want to help me create new episodes, please go to my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Keto Woman or simply hit the support button on the Keto Woman podcast website. It's thanks to the two Keto Dudes that I'm hosting this podcast. So please consider heading to their Patreon page at patreon.2keto.com and help them bring you more podcasts like this one. Please help other people hear about and find this podcast by reviewing the show on iTunes and Facebook. Every star and review really does help. It doesn't go unnoticed by me, the people who regularly like, share and comment on my posts. Your support means the world to me. Thank you. This week's quote is from Robert Wagner. A dog will teach you unconditional love. If you can have that in your life, things won't be too bad. I have got another one because this is so true of mine. And this is from Franklin P. Jones. Scratch a dog and you'll find a permanent job. Bye-bye, Keto lovelies. Listener.